great day. It's a great day to be at church with my brothers and my sisters. It's a great day to know that when I get home, I got a new granddaughter. I like that. Already had my first nap with her yesterday. So he put on my chest. We were both, we were just both a snoring, having a good time. And um, hey, that's the best snoozing of all. You know, when my when my kids got here, that's one of the that, boy, I napped with them a lot. And uh, I don't know about you, I like to nap. <clears throat> I don't know why I ever fought it as a kid, because I mean I really like it as an adult. And um, man, there's nothing better than snuggling a little one and and just makes you so peaceful and you relax. And so we're having a good time. Um, I, I told my daughter, make sure she marks all these times that she's had the, you know, Hannah's been a little cranky because she just got here and trying to get accustomed to this new way of living outside the womb and, and all of her little systems to get going. So she's being kind of cranky. I said, make sure you mark all these cranky times so that when she's 13 and you ground her, you have a list of why. So um, take your Bible and turn to Exodus chapter 13. We're going to finish out talking about the sanctification through uh, the, the uh, Passover. <clears throat> and we just want to talk about this morning the purpose for remembering. So the rest of the chapter, he is just rehearsing again the times and things like that and just giving them some reasons why that we're going to do this. So beginning in verse 5 of chapter 13. It says, it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee a land flowing with milk and honey, that thou shalt keep his service, keep this service in this month. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall, the, shall be a feast unto the Lord. Unleavened bread shall not be eaten seven days, and there shall no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with thee in all thy quarters. And thou shalt show thy son in the day, saying, This is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, and that the Lord, Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore keep this ordinance in his season from year to year. Father, again, we do thank you for all that you do, for the many blessings. We thank you for this day, this time that we have together. We pray that you would bless the reading of your word, the preaching of your word. Father, just use me as you desire. I surrender to you. I pray that you would use me the way you want me to be used, that your words can be spoken. And Father, we'll give you the praise and all the glory because you're the one who's worthy. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So he says, let me, let me tell you why we're doing this, why this is a memorial, why this is significant. It is part of the purpose of this is to remember, to remember, to remind the generations where the land came from. He said, when you get into the land, you're going to do these things because your children are going to ask, when you do this, when your sons are coming up and you get ready to do the Passover, you say, I'm, we're doing this because of what God has done, what God did unto me. Notice these are very personal. He said, this is done because of that which the Lord did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. Now, all of these, all of these men that came out of Egypt who were married, who had children or would have children, were to instruct their children when they had the Passover, when they celebrated the Passover, they were to tell them, we're doing this because what God did unto me, when you brought me out of the land of Egypt, when I came out of the land of Egypt, this is what God did so that I could be here today. Now he's going to repeat some of this and add a little more to it when you get to Deuteronomy. So we're going to have here shortly the giving of the law in Exodus and then, and then the detail of the law in Numbers and then the Deuteronomy, the second giving. And I remind you again, one of my favorite lines or one of my favorite scenes in, in uh, Filler on the Roof is where Tevye is trying to quote verses 
And, and he says, well, as King David said, and, and the rabbi helper said, well, that was, that was actually Moses. He said, well, as, as you know, so-and-so said, he said, that too was Moses. And he looked at me and he said, for a man that is slow of speech, he sure talked, talked a lot. So we're seeing a repetitiveness here. And by the way, you know, how many times does God have to say something for it to be absolutely his word, his way, it needs to be done? How many times? One. So if God mentions it several times, we should take notice, right? Now, this part is no longer for us. That's been fulfilled in Christ on the cross. But the fact that he keeps going over this and over this and over this should be something for us to think about the importance. Why did God mention this repetitively? Was it, as we tease it, Moses just couldn't get to the point? Moses must have been a Baptist preacher. Got to close three times. Got to have seven illustrations for every single point. I mean, you know. And so, but here he's again saying, hey, you're going to do this in this month. This is how you're going to do it. Seven days, no leavened bread, no, no leavened bread in your house, no leaven in your quarters, anything like that. So that you can say on this day, this is what God did when he brought me out. When I came out of the land, this is what God did. And in Deuteronomy chapter 6, one of the great chapters in all the Bible, in verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantedest not, then shalt thou have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. We remember this, he says, you need to do this and tell your children so that you can remember and not forget who brought you out of Egypt, who gave you this land. You came into this land, you didn't build the houses, you didn't dig the wells, you didn't plant the vineyards, you didn't do any of that, but you're eating and partaking and drinking and enjoying all the blessings of those. You walked into towns that had houses, you walked into the houses and had a place to dwell. You didn't have to build them, you didn't have to dig the garden, you didn't have to do any of that. Because God took care of that for you. And when you get there and you're full and you're satisfied and you're thinking how great is this promised land, beware lest you forget where you came from. So it's important for these things. The, the importance of doing the Lord's Supper is so that we remember where we came from. So we remember what it took to get us to the point of salvation. 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul is teaching Timothy about being a pastor. And one of the things he says to him, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is important that we learn how to pass down our faith. It's also important that we learn to pass down the history of our nation because our nation was conceived in liberty at the hand of God. And all the people that try to deny that say, oh, that's not true. I just gave you a few pieces here. In 1909, Theodore Roosevelt warned this, the thought of modern industry in the hands of Christian charity is a dream worth dreaming the thought of industry in the hands of paganism is a nightmare beyond imagining. The choice between the two is upon us. In 1917, the, the New York Bible Society asked Theodore Roosevelt to write a message which would be inscribed in the pocket New Testament and, and Psalms that they were issued to the soldiers. This is what he wrote. The teachings of the New Testament are foreshadowed in Micah's verse, Micah 6, 8. 
What more does the Lord require of thee than to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? Do justice and therefore fight valiantly against the armies of Germany and Turkey. For these nations in this crisis stand for the reign of Moloch and Beelzebub on this earth. Love mercy, treat prisoners well, succor the helpless, walk humbly. You will do, uh, I'm sorry, succor the wounded, treat every woman as if she was your sister, care for the little children, be tender to the old and helpless. Walk humbly. You will do so if you study the life and teachings of the Savior. May the God of justice and mercy have you in his keeping, Theodore Roosevelt. That was in a World War I pocket Bible that was issued to the soldiers when they went to war. Hmm. Really? God didn't have anything to do with our nation. Our founding fathers, our president, they didn't do anything with God. At some point, you ought to read Washington's farewell address. This is just one section I want to read to you. This is pretty lengthy into his, into his address, but in the middle of uh, he's just going through. If you've never read it, you need to read it. It is absolutely elegant. It is intense, and he deals with so many things that if you read it and look at it, all the warnings he gave, we're experiencing all the warnings that he said when he left office. And in this particular section, he says, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor or subvert these great pillars of human happiness, these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. The mere politician equally with the pious man, ought to respect and to cherish them. A volume could not trace all of their connection with private and public felicity. Let it simply be asked, where is the security of the property for reputation for life if the sense of religious obligation desert the oaths which are instruments of the investigation of courts of justice? And let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be concealed or conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar structure, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Founding father, first president, commanding general, prayer warrior. He understood the role of God in the forming and the keeping and the making of our nation. And he said without religion, without Christianity, without a dedication to God, there can be no morality. In one of his debates with a philosophy group at a college, a young man came to the mic, and, and, and I don't remember the, how he posed the question, but in essence he said, you know, don't you believe that, that God does not exist, that there's no chance of a personal God? And Mrs. Zechariah says, let me answer that by asking you some questions. He said, do you believe that there is evil in the world? And the young man quickly said, yes, absolutely, I would agree that there's evil in the world. He said, if there's evil in the world, then would you not agree that there must be good in the world by which evil can be derived? Well, yes, I would agree with that. He said, so then if you agree that there's evil in the world and there is good by which you can determine that which is evil, then does that not necessitate a moral law by which good is derived? And now the young man started to hesitate, well... Yes, he said, if you agree that there's evil and that there is good by which we can see evil and that there's a moral law that determines that which is good, then doesn't that necessitate a moral law giver? If there is a moral law giver, can that moral law giver be a man? And the young man paused and he looked at him and he said, what was my question anyway? You see, even, even simple human logic, flawed, mortal human logic can even come to some obvious conclusions. 
that, that if evil exists, there is good. And for good to exist, there's a moral law. For moral law to exist, there must be a moral law giver. And there's not a human that has ever lived or ever will live apart from Jesus Christ who could give that moral law because we are all in, inundated with sin. We are all tainted. And we all will do law based on what is best for us. What gives us gain, not what is right because it's right. God's moral law is right because it is right, because it is based on his character, his nature, his holiness, the fact that he is all-powerful, all-encompassing God. Our nation has lost this because we quit teaching this. I've shared with you, my dad was born in 1932, not far from here in Anadarko, Oklahoma. He was taught to read in school with a King James Bible. He was taught history with a King James Bible. He was taught math with a King James Bible. He was taught logic with a Bible. He was taught deductive and inductive reasoning with a Bible. He was taught history. He was taught, he was taught government and social studies with this book. I mean, well, how can you do that? You can't do that. Yes, you can. Everything that we need finds its origin in God. And God left us his book. We can see his moral law. We can learn when we're trying to learn our, our ciphers, as he used to say back in the day. Can you tell me a book that has more numbers in it than this one? Calculating lifespans, generations, how many people went into Israel, how many people died in the desert, how many then went into the promised land, on and on and on. If you want to look at civics and how a society should conduct itself with each other, it's all right here. An unbalanced scale is an abomination before God. To buy something, to brag about buying something for less than what it's worth, or to brag about selling something for more than what it's worth is an abomination before God. You want to know how to conduct business? Grab this book. You want to know how a civil society functions? Grab this book. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Both of those, by the way, are found in the book of Deuteronomy. You want to know history? Right here it is. And isn't it amazing, for all the deniers of the things of God, every time an archaeologist sticks a shovel somewhere in the dirt, they find some more proof about God. That the things in this book are accurate, that the history is correct. That all the people here actually existed. Want to get into science? Read the book. Well, you know, the Bible's not scientific. Really? So there's a... There is a, just lost his name, wrote this book, Starlight and Time. He's a nuclear physicist whose specialty is quantum mechanics. I'm sorry? No, and it's not Hughes. I'll think of his name later. I have the book. You can come by the office and look at it and get the name and find it. He even has an update to it now. I haven't got that one yet. And folks, I love science, but once you finish saying quantum mechanics. That's as far as I go. I'm done. And he's written a book on the science behind the creation of the universe. And he's the only Christian who set out to discover what principles God established by starting with the Bible. He took the Bible and looked up every verse, scoured the Bible for every verse that even remotely related to creation. And then he went out to look at what science matched the Bible. So consequently, he's the only scientist, child of God, who has a theory of the creation of the world that not only matches Scripture, but also fits Einstein's theory of general relativity. And it's brilliantly done. And it's written for morons like me. It's a little thin book. It's not very big. You can whip right through it. And he explains stuff for guys like me. 
when he talks about the expansion of the universe, he draws pictures of a balloon with little squares all over. And as you inflate the balloon, how those squares move away from each other so you can understand expansion. I like that. It's quantum mechanics for dummies. The second half of the book are his actual essays, his calculations, and all of his science. And I think it's like the third or fourth one when you read it. He, he, gives, a, he gives a lead into it, and then he says, if you're not a physicist, just skip this one. Determined as I am, I'm going to read it. About two or three sentences into it, I thought, just skip this one. Let's just go on to the next one, because it went real fast. You want scientists right here. Do you realize not one scientific discovery has ever contradicted the Bible? Not one. It always confirms the Bible. It doesn't matter what topic you want. You want romance. There is so much romance in the Bible, it's unbelievable. You want steamy romance? If you're a kid, ignore this. Adults, with your mate, read Song of Solomon. You know, Jewish men are not allowed to read the Song of Solomon until they're 30. So they don't get a perverted idea of the beauty of the intimacy of marriage. You want to know if things are okay to do? Read Solomon. He'll tell you all sorts of things. You, one of the greatest love stories in all scripture is David and Goliath. And how many of y'all are looking at me going, what? Remember David went to take food to his brothers and see how the war went to report back to his dad? And when he got there, he saw Goliath out here defaming the name of Israel and the name of God. And somebody said to him, you know, whoever kills a giant, his family's going to be, be tax exempt. He's going to be made rich. And he gets, he gets the king's daughter to wife. Oh? Huh? David was in love with Michael. Remember, he used to go into the palace and play his harp for the king. And while he was there, he fell in love with Michael. And if you read the whole story, you'll find it three times. The first time David is told, and two more times David asks, what happens to the guy that kills this giant? Gets the king's daughter. Let's go. Does not diminish one bit that David went out in the name of the Lord to serve the Lord and to stand for Israel and to stand for Jehovah God. But he also had a love interest in doing so. And when you read it, you first, when you get to the end of it, the first part of it, you'll think, that preacher done messed up because he says, here's my daughter. And he goes, well, who am I that I should be son-in-law to the king? Because the oldest had to go first. And after the oldest was married off, after the eldest was married off, and Saul was trying to find a way to destroy David, he sent his messenger, said, you go find out what he wants so that I can kill him. And they came back and he said, David wants Michael to wife, or Michelle, whichever way you pronounce it is. It's written, Michael. He says, you go tell him, you bring me 104 skins of the Philistines and I'll give you my daughter. Remember how David handled that? Brought 200. Now, I don't know if you understand this or not, but that's not usually something people are willing to give up. And when he came back, he didn't say, oh, who am I that I should be son-in-law of the king? He brought back 200 foreskins and said, where's my wife? You see, in the midst of serving God, there's also a love of a man for a maiden. You want romance? It's all right here. Everything is right here. Everything that we need is right here. We have wholeness in God. We have everything in His Word. It is a joy to read the Bible. I understand there are places that are drudgery when you're reading through numbers, when you're reading some of the places in Leviticus and all of the law and the repetitiveness of how you got to do this offering and this sacrifice and, and looking at all the, you know, if you got a spot on your arm and it's red in the middle and white around it and white in the middle and red around it, nah, 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 and you're like, ah. But the more you read that, and you read that, and you read that, and you make yourself endure those difficult places, you start picking up on things that open your eyes to the nature of God and to His love and to the beauty and the logic and the wisdom of God. You begin to understand the God of the Old Testament, the God that did so much to preserve Israel that is still preserving Israel today is the God who gave His Son for us. We can see for thousands of years the provision of God. 
And we can have confidence that no matter what I'm going through, God can preserve me. God can take care of me. God can redeem me out of the hand of the enemy. God can do what he wants to with me. And whatever he calls me to do, I can do in him. One of my favorite stories is Gideon trying to thresh wheat in a hole. You, know, you need air, you need wind. That's why you thrashed wheat up on, mount, up on hilltops, so you throw everything up in the wind and blow the chaff away, and the seeds would fall back down. But if you did that where you could see it, the Philistines would come, I mean, the, the Gideonites would come and steal all your stuff. So Gideon is down here in a hole trying to thresh wheat with no wind, and an angel shows up and says, Gideon, mighty man of valor. <laughs> yeah, real valor there. I wonder sometimes he's going, <laughs> but the Bible says that God's call, God calls things that aren't as though they are. When he came and addressed him as mighty man of valor, he wasn't right then, but he was about to be. Because with God, all things are possible. With God, anything can be done. He goes on to tell us in verse 11 that this is to remind the generations of the cost. In verse 11, he says, And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the male shall be the Lord's, and every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborns of man among thy children thou shalt redeem. Aren't you glad he said to redeem them? There wasn't an option if you didn't want them. How sad is it we throw away our children so readily today. He said, we're going to do this so you remember the cost. The firstborn belonged to the Lord. It was a reminder of what it cost, what it took to bring them out of Egypt. And what it was going to cost God in the future when he sent his anointed one to be the sacrifice for our sins. And then also, not only that, but to remind the generations of the provision and the, pers the preservation of God. Wow, did I get those right? Provision and preservation of God. And it shall be, verse 14, when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what is this? That thou shalt say unto him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go, that the Lord slew all of the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that open of matrix, being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine land, and for frontless between thine eyes, and for strength, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. There was a great cost to bring the children of God out of Egypt. And it was a symbol of the great cost that God would give to redeem us from death and sin. I'm always struck by the verses that talk about with his fingertips that God flung the stars into the heavens, but he had to bear his arm to bring us salvation. The intensity in that phrase, and, and we don't think about it much today, but the fact that God had to brace himself, had to, had to concentrate, had to take notice to give his son to come in human flesh and pay the price for sin, fact that it taxed God to provide salvation. I should make a stop and be grateful. I should make a stop and ponder what could tax the great and mighty all-powerful God. 
nothing can tax him. He, he speaks things into existence. He can speak things out of existence. He spoke the world into existence. He, he just he spit on the ground and made some clay, and he, and he formed a man, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And, and suddenly, a piece of clay is this body that we have. This didn't evolve over billions of years. God created it and went, in all the complexity that we see and that we still are trying to unravel and understand, God just did it. The salvation was more than just a word. It was more than just a thought. He had to bear his arms. He had to dig in, so to speak. He had to come and put on the body of a man, live perfectly with the ability to sin and yet say no to sin, to be mocked and tormented and tortured and, and just beat beyond recognition. Literally, there's not a figure of speech. The Bible says that he was beat, the, 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 the um, scourging disfigured him so greatly he was not identifiable as a man. You couldn't tell what he was. He was just a piece of raw meat bleeding. God! But that was nothing. And the cross, having the nails driven in the nerve bundles in the wrist and in the feet, having his shoulders dislocated, twisted, and hanging on dislocated shoulders so that to say anything from the cross, to even take a, a breath, he had to stand up on the nails and pull himself up to be able to take a breath and to speak the things he said from the cross was nothing. It was when holy God in human form became sin. That's where the real burden was. That's where the real grotesqueness of what he had to do came in. Because we, we think in terms of my sin. Well, I, I'm really, I'm not all that bad. I, I, I've done this, I've done that, but I, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a pedophile. I'm not a, I'm not a murderer. I'm not a rapist. I'm not the sick, wicked stuff that Hamas is doing to people. I'm not anything like that. Except that we are. Without God, any of that is available to us. Any of us without the control of God, without the touch of the Holy Spirit, any of us can be any of those things. Our mind is terrible. The Bible says that the heart is evil above all and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. And on the cross, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ, the anointed Messiah of God, didn't just die for sin. The Bible said He became sin for us. So we could have His righteousness. Understand, the most wicked people you can think of, Christ became their sin. Christ became our sin. Christ became the sin of every human who would ever live and who had ever lived up to that point. Billions and billions of people, all their combined sin, all that combined wickedness was laid on Jesus Christ. And in that moment, the Bible says He became sin. How horrible that a perfect holy, sinless God would now become the sin of every human being ever. And to bear that, can you, can you understand a little with the mind that we have to understand? Can you understand a little why Jesus was sweating drops of blood when he prayed in the garden, when he said, if there be any other way, Father, let this cup pass? If there's any other way, can I do it? Is there anything else that we can do to pay this price? Nevertheless, not my will, your will. Nevertheless, I drink it all. There's a cost. Israel was to remember the cost. He was to remember the preservation. He was to remember the rescue. He was to remember it all. 
He used to do this every year. To be able to stop and look at what it cost to get them out of Egypt, just as we stop every time we take the Lord's Supper to look at what it cost God to redeem us from our sin. And if I was God, and you should be glad that I'm not, but if I was God, there'd be a whole lot more than just saying yes to get saved. There would be a whole lot more you had to do. You would have to jump through hoops like you can't believe the sacrifices you would have to make, the personal pain you'd have to go through to be able to receive forgiveness would be tremendous because of what I had to make my son do. But God said, if you will just believe, if you will just believe to the point that you will trust my son, I will save you, I will forgive you. Do we realize what forgiveness means? We have such a messed up idea of forgiveness. We have a fight. We, we, we want people to promise they'll never do it again. And then I'll forgive you. We, we make all sorts of stipulations. But forgiveness means I give up my right of retribution. So if you offend me somehow, let's say that, let, let's say that we're, we're teasing back and forth and, and, and I pop off something and, and, and Brother Robbie pops me in the mouth. Now, one of us owes the other one something. Now, in my mind, he owes me because he hit me. In his mind, I owe him because I mouthed off. So we need to settle this somehow. Or maybe I didn't mean what I said, and he hit me anyway. Because, you know, Robbie's such a mean guy. I hope you don't mind me picking on your brother. <laughs> Forgiveness says he struck me, he owes me something. Either he has to stand there and let me hit him because he knows for sure there's no way I could whip him if my life depended on it. Or he has to pay me some financial whatever I think is worthy of the crime, worthy of his sin. There's something he owes me. I have a right to retribution because he offended me. And forgiveness says, Robbie, I, I'm not going to make you pay anything. That's forgiveness. I'm giving up my right of retribution. Do you understand how significant that is that God says that we receive forgiveness through Christ? God gives up his right of retribution when we believe in his son and trust him for salvation. God has every right to draw from us eternal death. But when we trust his son, he gives up that right so that he can make us the righteousness of his son and we can live with him eternity in, for eternity in heaven. Forgiveness. There's a cost. It costs God everything. It costs us nothing. All we have to do is acknowledge, admit our sin and trust Jesus Christ. Have you done that today? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you come and said, Lord, forgive me, I am a sinner. I believe your Son took on my sin and died for me. And I trust that as payment for my sin. And God said, when we do that, He instantly saves us, forgives us of our sins, and seals us for eternity with His Holy Spirit, making us right in Him. Have we trusted Christ? Christian, have we pondered just what it means to be forgiven? The mercy that was shown on the cross. Have we let that translate into mercy being displayed by us to those around us? James says that we will receive judgment without mercy if we have not given mercy. And he's talking to Christians there. One day we're going to be judged for what we do in this life before God. We're going to stand before Jesus. He's going to judge our works. And those that we did for Him and, and, and for His glory will come through as awards. Whatever that means, some reward. But it is possible to not have a full reward or have no reward at all. 
part of that's going to determine how merciful we are. The mercy that Christ uses to judge us and our works will be totally linked to how merciful we've been with people around us. How are we children of God? Are we living the mercy and grace of God and displaying that to others in our life? Or do we got ours? Now, it's up to everybody else. Father, whatever we need, whatever our hearts need to do with you today, whether that is to come to trust you as salva for salvation or, or we need to come back to you and rededicate our life to you and, and, and either become merciful or, or, or gentle or whatever it is that we need to become in you so that we can reflect you more. Father, whatever that is, would you give us the courage and the strength to take care of that today? Father, we give this all to you. We ask for you to touch us in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand to our